So we'll let everybody enter in and get set up for this, but I just want to start off by just uh, thanking everybody for taking the time and welcoming you. Uh, good morning from where, where I am, good afternoon from where Manu is, and, and good evening, perhaps wherever else you might be, be watching this, either live today or since we're recording this, uh, you may be watching this later, later on afterwards. Um, as we're just getting set up here, I just, I'll just quickly, quickly say, uh, for those who may not know me, I'm Todd McDevitt. I'm a senior investigator here at the Gladstone Institutes uh, and also a professor uh, in bioengineering therapeutic sciences at UCSF and program director of the joint uh, UC Berkeley UCSF graduate program. Um, and this uh, today is the kickoff of a new series from us. Uh, Manu recently spoke uh, to an audience of us here at Gladstone and that, that event and several others along with it, but that one in particular really catalyzed uh, are this new series that we wanted to kick off. Um, and so this is a, a new partnership that uh, Gladstone, along with the University of Washington's Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute, uh, as well as uh, with colleagues from UT Austin and Georgia Tech, uh, we're starting off this new uh, series entitled Amplified Race and Reality in STEM. Um, this is really, I, I think obviously, most people know where, why the motivations for this, but this is really a national platform to really keep these conversations, these candid conversations around race and diversity in STEM um, at the forefront of our, our minds and of our discussions as it, as it should be. Um, and so this is, the goal of this is going to really keep this uh, conversation going and Black Lives Matter at the forefront of our minds throughout 2020 and into 2021. And hopefully, I guess someday we would say that we wouldn't need a series like this, that it would, it would the success of it would be when we don't have to hold these. Uh, but I think for the time being, we know that they are um, really necessary and really uh, for everyone's benefit. Um, so let me, let me just then take a minute to personally welcome and, and introduce to, um, our kickoff speaker, uh, Manu Plot, uh, who's an associate professor at Georgia Tech. Um, I have been uh, incredibly fortunate to know Manu uh, for more than 15 years. Um, our <laughs> I know, we're all Manu. Um, but this really, you know, I've known him since he was at the end of his PhD uh, and, you know, Georgia Tech wisely at that time saw all the promise uh, that Manu had because he was already uh, a success by all the metrics. And before he even went off for a postdoc, he was offered a faculty position. And, uh, and that was to a great benefit of Georgia Tech uh, and has just been fantastic means for which he and I as colleagues together for more than 10 years uh, than really while I was at Georgia Tech. And since moving from there, we've still stayed a part of several uh, research centers together. Um, we're now on our, our second uh, research center uh, working together. But one of the things in those is that in addition to the, um, the numerous research contributions that Manu makes, and, and he'll have a chance, I think, to discuss and address how he has integrated that uh, different aspects into his research program, He's also been incredibly active and incredibly successful. I tell people, and I mean this, that you know, most of us can only, most of us in a lifetime will not be able to achieve what Manu has done in the, in the start of his career. Um, and there's several programs with that, probably most notably, and one that I know he's, he's particularly proud of, and one that I was able to see witness from the start to where it is now was the Project Engages, uh, which is a really powerful, probably to me, one of the, the most well thought out, most effective, uh, uh, outreach uh, programs to really promote STEM uh, to to undergrad uh, to URM, but Black uh, students in particular, and its successes just keep multiplying with the years. Um, before I start over, you know, we we started this, and and um, sort of sadly, you know, this was kicked off by a number of events earlier this year that had happened, starting around, really catalyzed around the death of George Floyd and his murder, and then the week that we were first or that we were preparing this for Manu's earlier talk was then the shooting mur uh, murder again of Rayshard Brooks. And <laughs> again, we're just days from another, another event. And I just, you know, every single time I don't, I think it's just heartbreaking to see this and to see that this is what's kicking off and with Jacob Blake earlier this week, but it only just re reinforces why these conversations are necessary, why we all need to be mobilized, why we all need to be asking of ourselves and doing more and not just bothered by it, but bothered to the point of action. So with that, Manu, please, you know, thank you again so much. Uh, I'll try to keep it together better than last time, although this is obviously not easy. And when I hear you speak about it, it just, it, it hits me pretty hard with, with 
just knowing you as well as I do. So thank you again, and please take it away. Okay. Um, thanks again, Todd, Megan, and Gladstone, but also I'm glad that it's brought into other institutions, including my own institution, Georgia Tech, to help host. And I know Kali Mitchell played a big role in that. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in because, you know, I just throw all the slides in and we'll see where it goes. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk to you while I do that in case I don't do it correctly. So we want to do that. That's there. And you can see the slides. Okay, excellent. So uh, good afternoon. Um, here we go again. I'm gaslighting in the academy, right? Actually making Black Lives Matter. And I think Todd set up motivation for all of these things. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech and Emory University, their biomedical engineering department. Platlab.com is my website, check us out. And before I get into this, you know, I, you know, in my thoughts are really all the people in um, the wake of Hurricane Laura. I know a lot of people in Houston, a lot of people in Louisiana. So it's just one thing on top of another that we as Americans hopefully will get through together. So I just started, I was really looking forward to Monday being a really good day. Um, I was kicking off a new semester, having my lab meetings all over again. Um, and then I was getting nervous about thinking about preparing this talk and deciding if I would add new things or rehash the old version. And I woke up like, oh, this is going to be a good week, right? Or that's what I was thinking. And then I woke up. And I think we all know what was on the TV screen when I woke up. Hashtag Jacob Blake. There goes the week. We're back to it and there's another one. And again, I'm going to give you this throwback from May 26, a comedian, I'm Quinta Brunson, who said, being Black is having a good day and then seeing another Black person was killed for no reason. Then you have to think about and talk about that all day or don't and numb yourself. It's a constant emotional war. And it was back. And so I actually kind of avoided, you know, my faculty Twitter that day because I didn't want to see people kind of going in or expecting to make a statement. Because it was just like, here we are again. So I never need to see another video of police killing a black person ever again. They're still showing that video on TV. I don't need to see it. I understand the benefits of why others were showing it because people didn't believe these things were happening. That was George Floyd and the rest and the rest and the rest. I don't ever need to see another video again. I don't ever want to see another video of police killing a black person. I don't need to and I don't want to ever see one. And actually, I don't want police to kill a black person ever again. That handles all of the rest. So I call this talk gaslighting, and, I, and we think we should talk about it. So again, gaslighting is a form of manipulation that occurs in abusive relationships. It's insidious, sometimes covert type of emotional abuse where the bully or abuser makes the target question their judgments in reality. So, you know, when George Floyd's murder happened and Rayshard Brooks and, and, and Breonna Taylor, there was lots of conversations that were going on. Then people started talking about going back to school and those conversations kind of dimmed down and all of us were like, oh, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I'm not saying that there was enough time to say it wouldn't. But then Jacob Blake happens and we're back. So anyone who got comfortable thinking, right, change is going to happen, it jumped back into the main stage. And I always go back to Colin Kaepernick, who is currently being gaslighted um, by NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, who says, oh, I should have believed him and now I do believe him. That's another gaslight. But this started years ago when he was just kneeling, not, just to bring attention to police brutality. And again, at the time, the statistics from 2015 were that black men um, were uh, five times as likely to be killed if they were unarmed as unarmed whites. I clearly am a black man. I live in this black body. I have black family members. And so these things affect me, even though some of you may know me as this professor. But again, I always like to bring up, these are my beautiful brothers. I'm the second oldest of six boys. And so when I say these things affect me, I think about my brothers as well, who are also out living in the world. And happy to report that the youngest brother um, actually just started his freshman year at Morehouse College, my alma mater. So I think about these things and how black bodies are viewed and particularly how black male bodies are viewed and how they're viewed as dangerous. And I smile all the time, as many of you know. But this is where the gaslighting gets crazy. I mean, I'm a scientist, we like evidence, we like to show things, but that's where gaslighting really becomes this issue. Well, what do police say whenever they kill an unarmed black person? I thought they were going to kill me. And that supposedly is good enough excuse. So Jacob Blake thankfully has not been killed. He's fighting for his life in a hospital. Family man, he had three children. He was shot seven times in the back. Many of us have seen the video, whether we've wanted to or not, and we continue to see it. Um, unarmed, obviously. But he was shot in front of his three 
black sons. And again, he is currently fighting for his life in the hospital, 29 years old. We can go back in time, Stefan Clark, he was 22 when he was killed, father of two, in his grandmother's backyard. Cops thought he had a gun. Um, he actually just had a cell phone. Most of us do have cell phones. Botham Jean, not even safe in his own home. He was 26. He was shot by a police officer in his own home while resting, eating ice cream. Uh, it was an, actually a police officer who broke it and shot him. She mistakenly thought it, he was in her apartment. Sandra Bland, still just hurts my heart when I see um, her pictures, um, was 28, because this happens to Black women as well. She died in a jail cell. And why was she arrested? Because she was driving her car and a police officer pulled up behind her. She pulled over so that the cop could pass, but because she didn't turn on the turn signal, he then put on his uh, lights and pulled her over. And she later died in prison, in the jail cell. But Black trans women matter as well. Um, this is Leilene Polanco. She actually died in Rikers Island. She was 27. And they always get mistreated for a number of reasons. The Department of Corrections didn't want to house a transgender woman in Gen Pop with the cisgender women. And so then they thought about placing her in the men's ward, but instead of doing that, they placed her in restrictive housing similar to solitary confinement. Orlando Castile was also in Minneapolis, um, 32 years old, was murdered at a traffic stop in front of his young daughter. So we're seeing a bit of a pattern here, but that doesn't matter. Your children won't save you. And his fiance, who was live streaming it to Facebook Live, which is how we all saw it happen. What was his crime? He warned the police officer that he had a license to carry and the weapon was in the glove box. And when the police said, well, why don't you pull it out? He did and was shot multiple times. I was afraid for my life. I thought they were going to kill me, gaslight. But if we wanted to believe them, because that's the point of gaslighting, maybe you wanna believe. I was afraid for my life. Well, takes me back to the Charleston Nine, Charleston, South Carolina, these nine black parishioners, when the young white male entered and began to pray with them. Oh, sorry. And he began to pray with them. Um, I'm not sure where my things are gonna go, right. And then he began to kill them. Uh, shot several people in the church, nine of them passed away. But after the cops caught him, knowing that he was armed with multiple weapons, multiple active guns, that he had already shot living people, they caught him calmly and took him to Burger King. Whereas the other black people that I showed you had no guns, but the police were afraid for their life. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, um, one of the, the major high school shootings in this country in Parkland, Florida. Um, again, this, this individual had shot up multiple students, killed several young people. They knew he had guns. They knew he was willing to shoot people, but they later apprehended him without incident. But black unarmed men and women keep getting killed. And now here we are today, August 25th, 2020, Kenosha, Wisconsin. At a protest, this 17 year old white male who's walking around with a long gun armed anyway, uh, kills two people and injures one. He drove from Illinois to Kenosha, Wisconsin to protect businesses, he says. But he too was safely arrested, unlike these other unarmed black men and women who were killed by police. James Baldwin said, to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. And this is why, when we want to ask, what are the unfair practices that are happening? What are the systemic racism in policing? And then you hear federal officials say, there's no such thing as systemic racism, and the numbers cannot be explained. But what do we also hear? We're American citizens. What do we hear? The police are here to protect the community. Okay, we'd like to believe that. But the police were not the protectors for these people in their community, and actually were the reason that they were murdered. Brianna Taylor, as we know, was um, a wonderful EMT, family woman, loved her family, loved her friends. And as I said before, every time I talk about her, it makes me sad because thick black women are like my best friends in the world. And I would have hung out with her. I'm probably a little bit too old, so maybe she would have thought I was old head. But she's gone. And as we know, her killers have still not even been arrested. One has been fired. Tony McDade is a black trans man who was killed by police. Elijah McClain was such a sweetheart. Um, George Floyd, we all have now been seeing the changes that are coming around because of his unjustified death. And Ahmaud Arbery was also happened here in Georgia, gunned down by a man who was a former police officer in a very quite vigilante style. And whatever reasons that are given by the police for why these people are now dead, the, the real truth is that they were killed while they were living. 
And that is all that we want to do is just to live. But police are taking away those options. And so when you tell us they're here to protect and to serve, this is why it becomes a gaslight. Again, Brianna's tell us murderers have still not been arrested and only one has been fired. Elijah McClain was killed more than a year ago by police and his case is now being reopened to determine if charges will be filed because of the, re the, 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 the actual pressure from protests in these later times. Ahmaud Arbery's murderers were not arrested until 74 days after he was killed. They probably weren't going to arrest them until the video was released. Um, and Sandra Band's killers will not be arrested. That determination has already been made. And so no one, quote, is responsible for their lives being taken from them. And then we hear in these common days and times, we need law and order. Gaslight, we need law and order. Eric Garner was one of, um, he was actually murdered through a chokehold by police several years ago. Um, this is in New York City, and his mother is now one of the mothers of the movement. And the man who filmed Eric Garner be choked out actually was sent to prison, okay? But the officer who murdered Eric Garner was not. And it took a while before he actually even was fired from his job. But then you can also see how the media actually relates these stories. So it actually says the officer who was fired for using a chokehold on Eric Garner is suing to get his job back. So even though he was fired later for killing an unarmed person, he wants his job back. But let's fix these headlines. It's not the man who filmed the Eric Garner um, video. He filmed the Eric Garner murder. That's the man they put behind bars. And it's not the cop who was fired for the chokehold. It's the cop who killed Eric Garner is suing to get his job back. But when you set one precedent, why can't others do that as well? Rayshard Brooks, who Todd mentioned in the opening, who was killed here in Atlanta at the Wendy's right up the street from where I live, that officer was fired, and he's actually now suing to get his job back. Because just because I killed someone who was unarmed doesn't mean I shouldn't be able to protect and serve the community. Gaslight. The officer who fatally shot 12-year-old Tamir Rice, he also was hired by another police department. He had actually had been brought up or he had had um, inappropriate conduct before he moved to the police department in Cleveland, where he was when he killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice, and then afterwards has now moved on to another police department. But we want law and order, and the police are here to protect and serve. Gaslight. And the one cop that we know, that maybe there's gonna be others soon, that did go to jail for um, killing an unarmed person was a black officer in Minnesota um, who killed a white woman. And again, thankfully he's going to jail for that. But there's something a little bit different in that situation. And it makes the rest of us wonder what's going on. Well, we don't wonder. And now we take you back to Breonna Taylor. It has been more than 160 days and the cops who killed Breonna Taylor have not been arrested. This is the Eternal General, Attorney General of Kentucky. Yes, it's a black man, Daniel Cameron. That doesn't make it any better for us. And of course he was at the RNC convention touting this. And as the Attorney General who was there to enforce the laws of the state of Kentucky, he has the nerve to say her name on that stage, but not pursue justice in her name. So I'm going to jump turn this over to Tamika Mallory, who is, uh, who just says all the right things for me. This is a coordinated activity happening across this nation. And so we are in a state of emergency. Black people are dying in a state of emergency. We cannot look at this as an isolated incident. The reason why buildings are burning are not just for our brother, George Floyd. We're, they're burning down because people here in Minnesota are saying to people in New York, to people in California, to people in Memphis, to people all across this nation, enough is enough. Yeah. And we are not responsible for the mental illness that has been inflicted upon our people by the American government, institutions, and those people who are in positions of power. I don't give a damn if they burn down Target. Because Target should be on the streets with us calling for the justice that our people deserve. Way to stop it. Arrest the cops. Charge the cops. Charge all the cops. Not just some of them. Not just here in Minneapolis. Charge them in every city across America where our people are being murdered. Charge them everywhere. 
That's the bottom line. Charge the cops. Do your job. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about, the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. And every time I watch this video, at the end, she steps back and puts her mask on because we are in a time of COVID that is killing black and brown people at higher rates than others. So still being out there in the street, despite that risk as well. So many of you know, I went to Morehouse College for my undergraduate degree and I received an undergraduate liberal arts education. What does that mean? Well, you learn multiple topics. I learned about philosophy, religion, history, and despite being a biology major and a math minor. And when they told me that why I, the reason I needed to take history and learn about history is that if we don't learn from our history, then we are doomed to repeat it. So I said, okay, well, that makes enough sense. It will help me be a person who doesn't repeat mistakes. And so in my research process, uh, one of the projects that I've worked on was HIV and cardiovascular disease. And this was a great thing to work on. It actually took me to international communities. And at the time, well, even still, South Africa was the hotbed for HIV in the world. And this is me actually working in research labs with my good buddy, Rudy Gleason, and also ex experience in the South African life there. Um, and I was fortunate to make multiple trips, had some great collaborations there for some of our HIV cardiovascular work. But also when being in this space, also interacting with the people and learning about the history of South Africa. And I was scared the first time I went because South Africa went, had, you know, finished this period of what they called apartheid which was where the white South Africans dominated the black South Africans. The white South Africans are 5% of the population and the blacks are 95% and obviously indigenous. But apartheid ended actually in 1990 and it only lasted for about 46 years, but it was this tremendous overtaking. And when it ended in 1990, I went to South Africa in 2009. I thought, wait, it must be crazy there. Cause in the United States, slavery ended in 1865 Jim Crow, I say quote, ended um, as well in the 1960s, but we have so much strife. But you also, I also learned a lot by visiting in South Africa. And what did you actually figure out? I, I took multiple friends back with me when I made trips. And in the Apartheid Museum, they were showing this video um, one time when I was there. It was now available on YouTube. And it was mind blowing to me. This was a trip I made in 2014. So it was right after the Ferguson protests and the, the murder of Mike Brown. And you will start to see similarities. And I'd like to highlight some of those for you all. Doomed to repeat history. Will there ever be one man, one vote in South Africa? No. Isn't that why you are almost certain to be faced with a bloody war? No, but there's, no, there's not one man, one vote anywhere in because Africa. Will there be one man, one vote? Certainly. That is inevitable. There will be a one man, one vote in this country, and there will be a majority government in this country. Led. But that majority government will accommodate everybody. Led by? Mandela. Of course, she's speaking. This is Whitney Mandela, Nelson Mandela's wife. And of course, we know he was in prison for years in South Africa. The but book. we're still fighting for one. To make but we're fighting for the vote right now in America. The this book, One Person, No Professor. Vote, really came out of the fact that our democracy is under assault. And it's under assault in the most subtle, seemingly reasonable kinds of ways that are in fact very pernicious, very racist, um, very class. We have to make to apartheid unworkable and our country ungovernable. The accomplishment of these tasks will create the situation for us to overthrow the apartheid regime and for power to pass into the hands of the people as a whole. Large 
large scale protests of the young people singing protest songs. This is Portland, Oregon in the United States. Townships, young people rendered the streets ungovernable. This ungovernability was a mixed blessing for the political leaders. Many of the young lions were beyond their control. Even in the protest, they know there were only laws one language. We're not listening the language them. of the Kaspers. We have no arms. We have stones. We have boxes of matches. We have to wash out the tear gas that puts in their eyes. Sorry, sorry. This is Min oh, sorry, sorry, go back, go back. This is Minneapolis. If I could do this right, sorry. <laughs> uh, fairly big fire, uh, quite dense. Make Last the situation night, this ungovernable. This was the that auto was the, zone. There's a target behind the me. There's a car in, on fire in, in the parking lot behind my, uh, my photographer. But most of the attention is right here on the police station. Uh, we seem to have a lull in it right now, uh, Lawrence, uh, but it has been calm all day. I, I have to say this. Standing in the middle of the street, you know, you need to get out of the street immediately. I don't hear you. Standing in the middle of the street. This is the police against citizens. I just want to remind you all of this, okay? I don't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'll be. Where milk is the best way to get the burn and the sting of the tear gas out. This is Washington, D.C. repeating itself. Back to South we Africa. have the very strong feeling that they are here to kill us, not to protect, no, not to protect anybody. We have the been lenient and patient. Don't push us too far. Don't push us too far. Good evening. A general state of emergency has been declared throughout the country. A state of emergency. Governor Evers also issued an executive order declaring a state of emergency following those protests. Now, the order calls for more members of the National Guard to support first responders. Now, yesterday, local officials requested the help of the National Guard. 250. The measures published today give wide powers to the security forces. They are empowered to enter premises without a warrant and take steps they deem necessary for the maintenance of public order or safety. A ban has been placed on the taking of unrest pictures without the permission of a commissioned police officer. A ban has been placed on taking unlawful pictures. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? Okay. And the CNN reporter, we all remember, was arrested in Minneapolis and taken away, even though he showed his credentials and a part of our free press. And so I share all those things with you because these are all things that, are, that I am noticing, picking up and thinking about that are happening in America. And relating it back to what I've seen and what I've learned about what's going on in apartheid South Africa is actually, it's just wild to see it happening in what we would have thought 
would not happen in the United States. And so I bring that up because uh, I want to show this intersectionality piece because all of us have our own different multiple things that we're dealing with at any given time that make up our identities. But just as a Black American, we could put just those baselines on, but we have to add in additional things because then COVID-19 is overlaid on top of police brutality. And so what does that intersectionality then look like? We've got to think about racism, COVID-19, police brutality, police killing. I separate those very specifically at the direction of my sister-in-law because there's police assault, sexual assault of women, and they, everyone doesn't always get killed. Then there's the returning to school for those with children. How do we do that safely? Black parents worried when their daughters leave the house. Black parents worried when their sons leave the house. Do you protest or not? What is that risk? Leaving the house at all with the risk of COVID, particularly in Southern states where the science is not being paid attention to. Then there's an election. Will I be able to vote? Is that supposed to be what makes things change? One man, one vote, one man, no vote. All of these other things are complicating um, what we face on a daily basis. And then I have to go to work. And at my job as a professor, well, I say go to work, um, clearly, um, I'm told we believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to believe people. And there have been some revved up, amped up activities, particularly post George Floyd. But as mentioned, a lot of different priorities started to get shifted as students had to return to class and other things were um, coming online. But I want to just, again, give some statistics. I said these before. There are less Black men in medical school today than there were in 1979. And I was born in 1979. From 2002 to 2017, there was an increase from 5.1% to 5.4% in the number of Blacks who earned PhDs, the number of Black students who earned PhDs. But in 2017, there were more than a dozen fields, largely within STEM, where not a single doctorate degree was awarded to a Black person anywhere in the United States. And again, African-American tenure track faculty in engineering, I'm one of those, um, have increased from 2% to 3% between 01 and 2012, which was a statistically significant increase, but it has now dropped back to 2%. I think it's actually now 2.5%. But we've been working on this for years, we're told, in the academy, but racism. So it's really cute to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's nice and it's polite conversation, but racism is really what we need to be talking about. And as the wonderful Leon Levan Sand says, let's call a thing a thing, people. And I want to show this video because in all of that other intersectionality and work and thinking about COVID and parents and friends and police brutality, there's been a group of Black engineering faculty that have really started to put together some demands, some action items, and really wanted to bring attention to what it is to be a Black engineering faculty member. Um, and they're doing all of this atop of everything else that people are doing in the world. And I really have to credit the three Black women um, uh, engineering faculty members leading this, Carlotta Berry, or Dr. Carlotta Berry, Dr. Monica Cox, and Dr. Tahira Reed. So if you'll indulge me, this is on YouTube, but I'd like to play it for this audience while I, while I have you here. I'm black with a PhD, but I still could have died by a knee. I am George Floyd. I've succeeded using my head, but I still could have been shot in bed. I am Breonna Taylor. I think teaching and learning is fun, but I could get killed while out on the run. I am Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm a hidden figure in STEM who puts my hood on. Like, like Trayvon. Trayvon. And can't be stopped, like Sandra Bland. All racism, I do condemn. I engineer like Imhotep, but my black skin, I can't sidestep. I can't breathe. I'm Eric Garner. This is not a game. I'm Tamir Rice. What if I'm next? Then it's hashtag Denise R. Simmons. If it's hashtag Leroy Long, I am Laquan McDonald, I am Ayanna Stanley Jones, I am Walter Scott. I am Katherine Johnson, Philando Castile, Alberta Spruill, and Samuel DeBose. We, we will not, not be silenced. silenced. It is our turn to have a say. So on behalf of the STEM community, this is what Black STEM faculty like us have to say. 
It says PhD outside of our office doors, but we still get mistaken for janitors. And we love our custodians. There's no hierarchy when it comes to black labor. They allowed us to get where we are. Say something back to speak up and speak out. Then we get blacklisted or just get kicked out. Love to teach, only to get called bad names. Names they wouldn't own if you called them out. Love to do research. But it's only safe if we sell out. Don't research black or shout. shout. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Black lives matter. 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 That's been is available on YouTube. And I just want to say again, we're all black engineering professors. So if you'd ever do a black woman engineering professor, there's several there. But taking the time to put this together, we're not video editors, but Brooke Coley, a professor at ASU, did an amazing job. And what is that and why, did, why are we coming together? Because of our jobs. We love our jobs and we are trying to ask these research questions, do this work. And again, systemic structures are in place. So again, I bring you these results um, from NIH that did um, a meta-analysis of research grants. This was published in 2011, my second year as a tenure track faculty. So great news that morning, again, that all things normalized, black PIs are 50% less likely to be funded. 50%, that means if you've had similar training, similar publications, all the rest. What's the reason behind that? They did an updated study in 2017, and the numbers are still very similar. But even look at this, black scientists are only 1.5% of the total NIH R1 applicant pool. And of those of them that mix, we're still facing incredible struggles to get our work funded. And they've done another, uh, several other new analyses that have come out in the last year, published in Science Advances and some in PNAS. And the bottleneck is, uh, one of the major bottlenecks is that the preliminary score, when everyone reviews their grants while they're home and decide who they're going to score initially, black professors are less likely to even be discussed at the, at the, at the review panel. And another follow-up study has even shown that the topics that black professors are researching are topics that are less likely to be scored well into, into fund. I study sickle cell disease. It's a health disparity. It predominantly affects African Americans in the United States. I care about it and it should be funded. But when we talk about, well, who's doing that? I'm a good person. I'm a good professor. I'm fair in my reviews. It's not me. Well, remember the scientific reviews that are happening, it's called peer review. Other professors are who are doing the scoring. And so when it's said that science is a meritocracy, however, it, it holds true that it's believed that black professors exist, that we are peers in this peer review, and that if we're peers, then we have scientific goals that are worthy to be funded, and our research topics are worthy to be funded. Um, and so I think it's quite interesting when um, I've been on study section myself, and I tell people now, what should you do? Fund black professors or score black professors high. Why is that important? Sounds taboo, but I've served on the standing section of a study section and know that reviewers find a number of reasons to score their buddies high, uh, to score well-known professors high, even if the proposal is less well-written, or to someone high because of a particular research area. And these reasons are extraneous to the particular outcomes, but it happens. So why not score Black professors high when you see that there's a system that, if left to entropy, is stacked against us? And if there's no place for racism at your institution, your department, and your grant review panel, as stated in all of those wonderful publicly released statements after the murder of George Floyd, then who is it that's unfairly disadvantaging Black professors? And so again, if this mystery cannot be solved, and we're not sure who's doing the peer review, then perhaps it should just be made a policy to fund the proposals of Black professors at some percentage. We followed this strategy to promote early stage and new investigators because it was understood that helping professors establish a funding track record early in their career would be better for the entire scientific enterprise. Is this not the same thing true for Black investigators? Does the whole enterprise not benefit from having well-funded Black investigators? Now, be careful when you respond. Because one answer is racist and the other is not. And this is the importance of allyship. Use your privilege for good. Use it for good. As a man, I will always uh, be happy to support and promote women, especially when I see there's injustice. So cite black professors. We care about our H index as much as everyone else. These are things everyone could do tomorrow, right? And score black professors high in your grant reviews. Then let the discussion play out for what it is, okay? And find a reason to score black professors high. Trust us, 
We do our homework. We read the literature. We publish papers. We write science. Please treat us as those peers that do that. And so when people like to say this thing about, well, I'm not racist. I don't know if these people are racist. And, and I, I, wouldn't, I don't know their heart. So I can't tell you if a person is racist. Listen. We're going to get back to this. I love the way James Baldwin actually talks about this. And I ask you all to listen to this, especially us being scientists who we love evidence. So I'm going to play this clip of James Baldwin off, um, having a discussion with this professor from Yale. So I heard only some of it. Did you hear anything that you disagreed with? Or I disagreed you... with a great deal of it. And uh, of course, there's a good deal I agree with. But I think uh, he's overlooking one very important matter, I think. Each one of us, I think, is terribly alone. He lives his own individual life. He has all kinds of obstacles in the way of religion or color or size or shape or lack of ability. And the problem is to become a man. But what I was discussing was not that problem, really. I was discussing the difficulties, the obstacles, the very, the very real danger of death thrown up by the society when a Negro, when a black man attempts to become a man. All this emphasis upon black man and white does emphasize something which is here, but it emphasizes it or perhaps exaggerates it, and therefore makes us for, uh, put people together in groups which they ought not to be in. I have more in common with a, a black scholar than I have with a white man who's against scholarship. And you have more in common with a white author than you have with someone who's against all literature. So why must we always concentrate on color or on religion or this? There are other ways of connecting men. I'll tell you this. When I left this country in 1948, I left this country for one reason only, one reason. I didn't care where I went. I might have gone to Hong Kong, I might have gone to Timbuktu, I ended up in Paris, on the streets of Paris, with $40 in my pocket on the theory that nothing worse could happen to me there than it already happened to me here. You talk about making it as a writer by yourself, you had to be able then to turn off all the antenna of which you live because once you turn your back on this society, you may die. You may die. And it's very hard to sit as a typewriter and concentrate on that if you're afraid of the world around you. The years I lived in Paris did one thing for me. They released me from that particular social terror, which was not the paranoia of my own mind, but a real social danger visible in the face of every cop, every boss, everybody. I don't know what most white people in this country feel, but I can only include what they feel from the state of their institutions. I don't know if white Christians hate Negroes or not, but I know that we have a Christian church which is white and a Christian church which is, which is black. I know as Malcolm X once put it, it's the most segregated hour in American life is high noon on Sunday. That says a great deal for me about a Christian nation. It means that I can't afford to trust most white Christians and certainly cannot trust the Christian church. I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me, that doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything More against black over. people, but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the, if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks I give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. I don't know if NIH reviewers have anything against black professors, but I know they fund us at 50% the rate of other professors. I don't know if the academy doesn't think black professors are smart, but I know that for the last 40 years, only 2.5% of STEM professors have been black. I don't know if the Nobel Committee believes that there are not any excellent black scientists. I just know that a black person has never won the Nobel Prize for science. I don't know if Billy is a racist, but I know Billy's gotten comfortable winning in a racist system. I don't know if Ann is a racist, but I've heard Ann say racist things. I don't know if any of these people are racist, but it is too dangerous for me to truly believe that they are not. Listen, we are scientists. Our cells don't tell us how they feel when you say you need to know someone's heart. We look at what they do. We look at the actions, what we can measure, what are they showing? That's how we decide what systems are happening or what's changing. So let's all just find our own personal purpose here. And I wanna take this back again to um, Jacob Blake and his sister was speaking out and she said some words that I found just terribly moving um, that really capture some things. I am my brother's keeper. 
And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, mm -hmm. make sure you say son, make sure you say uncle, but most importantly, make sure you say human. Human life. Let it marinate in your mouth, in your minds. A human life. Just like every single one of y'all and everywhere in Wausau, we're human. And his life matters. Humans, we are all humans. And when you hear people talk about, we're gonna put down the protests and the violence, and we're gonna stop all of this and stop. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him. This is a quote from Bayard Rustin, who was um, one of King's top men and um, helped actually organize the March on Washington for jobs and peace. Whew, so let's do a bit of a palate cleanser here for a second. So racism is terrible. Blackness is not. I love being black. Most of the black people I know love being black. And so just to share some of this with you, I actually wanted to share this clip um, from a TV show that came on in the late 80s, early 90s, A Different World. Um, and it was about an HBC or Historically Black College University, um, Hillman College. And I'll just play the clip and let it speak for itself. Just look. We wear the mask. Oops, I always do that. That grins and lies that hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts we smile. Oh, I wish I were in the land of cotton, old time there and I've begotten. Look away, look away, look away, did she laugh? Oh, I wish I were in Dixie, away, away, in Dixie. I love that Nikki Giovanni poem, and I remember that episode well. Um, so let's talk about this. So I was at an HBCU, and so now I want to get to some useful things that people in the academy can do to change their 
faculty to change their student body. So that'll give you something to work with in these last 10 minutes. Um, so I call these these five boundary conditions between you and the diverse class, diverse faculty, whatever it is that you want. So there's a few different stages that people can get to, and we'll just talk, walk you through these stages briefly. And I'll share my credentials on why I feel like I'm qualified to talk about this, is I've been chair of admissions and recruiting at Georgia Tech in our biomedical engineering department for the last four years. Uh, we're ranked between number two and three, depending on the year um, in the country. And so year one, I was learning the ropes. But year two, we had eight black students out of an incoming class of 40. Um, year three, we had eight out of an incoming class of 39. And year four, we had 11 black students out of an incoming class of 48. And you see, we also got better with our Latinx student numbers as well. So I feel like I've got some street cred in how do you recruit them? So what we had to do was to address implicit bias first in the application review process, very clearly, not just send people to a diversity training, but to have actual hardcore discussions as well about it as we were preparing the committee. And then again, about being explicit, about being anti-racist in the student selections. If you wanna diversify your faculty or your student body, you cannot leave it up to entropy and say, if everybody judges as they think fairly, it will happen because it will not. So again, orient your admissions committee and your entire faculty and the critical piece, exercise oversight. If you hear a member say something that you think is a biased view about a student, correct it. That is your colleague, correct it with respect, but correct it. And then when the students come to visit your campus, this is key. Do not let students of color meet one-on-one -on -one with racist professors as much as you can help it. This takes some objectivity. Again, when people say, well, I don't know if someone's racist, you know, you actually do know. You don't want to say it, so don't say it, but you know. And if you're not sure, ask one of the faculty of color or the students of color in your department and they'll tell you. Because as soon as someone gets that red flag that they meet one-on-one -on -one with a professor, it's a wrap. Because why would I put myself in that risk? Okay, so that's if you, okay, so the first one is not getting sufficient numbers. So how do you go about doing that? Well, there's a lot of myths that are out there. Everyone says there's none out there. You can't find any. It's not true. We don't know where to find them. We live in America. We're like everywhere. They may not be prepared coming from those kinds of schools. And clearly that's code word for HBCUs, all women's schools, small liberal arts schools, et cetera. These are myths, and you should bust these myths in your own department. You can apply this also to the faculty search. If you're only searching at the schools in the top 10 in the country for faculty candidates, someone didn't get a PhD or postdoc there, then you're actually not looking for more, okay? Look at the US population. We're at 330 million. These are NSF statistics from 2017. Again, black folks make up about 13%. But even if you look at science and engineering degrees earned by underrepresented men and women, they are there, okay? And what I do always find interesting for the underrepresented groups, you see how women are actually always higher than men in these uh, categories, but that that difference decreases as you get to higher and higher degrees. So this is also showing that we are driving women out of the field as the degree level increases. But look at these numbers. Even if you see these numbers from back in 2014, they haven't updated it yet recently. But the big point here is what? All of these numbers are greater than zero. So when we say there are none out there, there are plenty out there. It is about going to get them if you really want to bring them to your institution. And that is why I wanted to show that clip from a different world that featured historically black college. I also wanna talk about my experience at Morehouse College because historically black colleges and universities are really doing heavy lifting in preparing STEM graduates that graduate programs should be going to look for. There's only a 101 accredited HBCUs and hopefully we won't lose too many in this financial crisis. Um, but they enroll about 300,000 students, which is about 80% of whom are African-American. That's why it's historically black. These are not all black institutions. And 70% are from low-income families. But look at this. Though they only enroll 10% of African-American students, they're responsible for 17% of the bachelor degrees earned by African-Americans. So they're graduating almost twice as many students as those in their white count and the primarily white institutions. Heavy lifting. And look at the numbers and 24% of STEM degrees earned by African Americans come from historically bad colleges and universities. There's a whole lot of things we could take and tear apart about why and I encourage you to read some of the literature from Ebony McGee and others who really study this. But these are fantastic numbers where you could go and recruit your students. So we don't get enough applications through the admissions committee. 
again, I've heard things about those kinds of schools. Let's talk about HBCUs a little bit more. Again, about 50% of professors um, that are, are professors at non-HBCUs have, uh, have a bachelor's degree from an HBCU, okay? So that's me and several other people. I work at Georgia Tech, it's a primarily white institution, but I got my bachelor's degree from an HBCU and there's a number of us out there. And you can see how we are responsible for the professional class. And why is that important? And I tell this to young people who are thinking about which college to choose, or if you're a parent and wanting to advise your own student. About 55% of Black HBC graduates say they strongly agreed that their college or university prepared them well for life outside of college, compared to less than 30% of non-HBC Black graduates. This is important because a common urban legend and misconception is, well, if you go to a Black school, you're not in the real world, so you won't know how to function in the real world. Well, let me tell you, the real professors that I had had been in industry, had been in the academy, had been in all these places, and they told us what it took to survive and would not let us, uh, would not let us get by if we were being successful in the ways that they saw fit. Next, if you can get them through the committee, but now you don't get them to come to your school. Well, here's what you've got to really, again, look at. How open and inclusive is your faculty? And you need to remind them. And I come from a faculty that has really listened when we had some sessions and discussions at faculty meetings to make sure that the faculty, make sure they're mindful of what they say. Resist off the cuff comments about race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, politics, or the need for diversity. And I say that in a way of like, oh, I guess we, I don't know why we need diversity. Don't say that to a black student who's in front of you. Again, keep them away from the racist professors. And more things that can easily become red flags for prospective students, and really more critically, prospective faculty candidates that you want to hire. Keep them away from those professors. Now, for the second visit, be honest and let them know what's going on. But if your first impression is that they actually meet with some people who say some crazy things, why would I do that if I could go to an institution where they, I have not been encountered with those topics? And so again, I'm not gonna to touch on the last two, getting them placed in the labs and getting them past qualified exams. That's another discussion for another time. And maybe your institution does not have that challenge, but those are things that were the next levels that we had to hit once we started bringing in these large numbers of students. But if you're not getting the applications and if they're not coming, you really need to be mindful, what is your school's reputation and what is your department's reputation? Georgia Tech has a great reputation for large numbers of uh, black and brown students getting them degrees. But when bioengineering and biomedical engineering was going, getting started, there was a bad rap. When I was there for grad school, there were a lot of black students who were kicked out for a number of different reasons. And it permeated the field where people were like, I'm not applying because y'all kick students out. Um, and it's how is that projected? If you're a successful black student, who wants to risk being the one to go to the place where there's all of these bad news, but I'll be the one to make it? Come on, why would you take that chance? So it's clear what statements are made in the admissions committee at recruiting weekend and by faculty in other public forums at your professional society meetings. What are your faculty saying that prospective faculty candidates and students are seeing? And then check them on that, correct them on that. More importantly, what does the broader African-American educational community think about your institution, your department? And more importantly, it's support or destruction of black talent. Because when we say we can't find it, if people are destroying them, as they go through the process, then we need to stop that from happening. And we will tell others, hey, I know you applied to this school, but let me tell you why that may not be the place for you. It's not because you're not smart enough. Here's just some things that we've seen. I don't know if they're racist, but here's the evidence of how they don't graduate their students who go in. What level of intensity does your institution, department, and lab put into retaining, supporting, and graduating diverse talent? If you put no energy into it and the talent and the numbers don't show, you won't get more. And so again, that is why I just wanted to, I'm gonna end with this thing about talking about privilege, because when you hear people talk about white privilege and they get always say, use your privilege for good. But I wanna stress, privilege does not mean that you did not work hard. Everyone works hard, okay? Privilege simply means that under the exact same set of circumstances, life would be harder without your privilege. Being poor is hard, being poor and disabled is harder. Being a woman is hard, being a trans woman is harder in this day and time in this country. Being a white woman is hard. Being a woman of color is harder, again, in the current state of society that we're in. Being a black man is hard. Being a gay black man is harder. It takes nothing away from the struggles that anyone else has had. 
And just, I gotta always plug my program because if your school also does not have a reputation for valuing diversity and you wanna help build it, build it at the grassroots, <laughs> grow your own graduate students. And so I love this picture of uh, this me, of course, um, my program manager, Ms. Lakita Cervant, and one of my heroes and mentors, Bob Neerum. And the three of us, and we lost Bob recently, um, earlier this year in, in March, um, but we started Project Engages to bring African-American high school students from Atlanta public schools and have them work in Georgia Tech research labs. And we actually pay them $10 an hour so that they can take these jobs instead of having to earn money at retail or fast food jobs instead. So that they can actually take a job where they can actually build their resume, learn some skill sets all at the same time and contribute to the cutting edge of science. And so in doing that, I always stress, and I've, I have, people have run programs for me my whole career, opened doors, things, and, and exposed opportunities I would never have thought about. I don't come from a lineage of scientists, but we're establishing that in my family now. But so always reach back and pull someone else up. But then be sure you celebrate them being themselves, because if anyone has to change who they are to be in your field, then it's a turnoff and they won't want to be in your field. And if they still join, they won't be their full creative, productive self and bring you the best solutions. And this is critical, even with your black faculty that you end up hiring, support them, allow them to study their research topics, review their grants and help them get over that hurdle of what other reviewers might say as we still fix that system. And then just finally to end, you hear a lot about being anti-racist. Um, and I wanna always give a shout out to Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones. Um, you can see all the degrees that she has. She's really done some wonderful work on systemic racism, institutional racism, structural racism, and individual racism. And she had a great TED talk, but the last bit, I like to end with that because it shows how, it gives a great analogy. She teaches through allegory and analogies about what we all can do to be anti-racist. And so we should all work to develop to our full potential, being inclusive of others, taking anti-racist activities, and also learning from history and making sure we don't repeat those patterns, but actually move forward. So thank you for listening and happy to take questions. Turning it back over to you, Todd. Oh, thank you, Manu. Um, <laughs> again, you just, you kill it every time, my friend. <laughs> uh, 
I thank you sincerely for doing this and just, I think, for making all of us rightfully uncomfortable wherever we might be right now. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in, and so I want to try and devote as much time to this as we as we can. Um, and, uh, and, you know, again, I, I don't think any of us expect you to have the answers for these, right. but I, I know from, I know you and I know you've heard some of these before, and I think that this is just good for other people if they haven't had this opportunity to just hear your perspective and some ways to help challenge us. Um, let me start with one of the ones, maybe some of the simpler ones, and we'll ease into the version, but I don't think these are easy. Is, is there anything you wish scientific journals would do? You talked about grants, but this is a good one too, in journals and practices where again, uh, you know, what, what can, what can we as a community, what do we need to be aware of? What do we need to be, you know, uh, paying more attention to in terms of our biases? But is there anything we can do to better support black editors, authors, readers? You know, what, what is it that we can do on that front? Maybe analogous to what you said for proposals. That is, woo, that's okay. I have never heard that question before. So, but some things that jumped into my head. Um, it would be interesting if some of the journals would have a consideration for certain institutes. I'm going to throw out HBCs, who the, the subscriptions are quite expensive. Right. And would there be consider what is like the endowment of the institution or some kind of graded scale on how much the subscriptions for that institution would cost to get the access to those journals out to a broader number of institutions, particularly if many of these minority serving institutions are predominantly undergrad, then now you reach a whole new generation of scientists. That's one thing I would say is easy for the journal to actually consider. Um, but as far as the, the peer review, I think it would be interesting. I, I, I don't have an answer, as you, as, as, as you could say. Um, there's been a, lots of talk about, you know, blinding the, the review, right? And I've actually, um, we did some evaluation for our, our high school program and I'm working with an evaluator. She actually, where we published that work, it actually was where the reviewers would not know who the author was, nor would they know the review, would the, review, the author know who the reviewer was. And it was quite an interesting thing because you had to even like block out your citations and the rest. And I'm sure people could still figure that out. So I, I don't have a full answer, but um, I do know this. I do say things about journal club and we're discussing a paper. I'm like, listen, they wouldn't have accepted this from us. So I, I tell my, my grads, I'm sorry I'm not famous enough yet that we couldn't have gotten away with this, but give me a few years. So um, I don't have full answers, but I definitely think making those subscriptions more equitable could be a great start. I mean, just you saying that stimulates something. I mean, is this something where, again, from a, a partnership allyship, should bigger universities that have larger ones either be negotiating or leveraging that uh, with their subscriptions and sharing it with institutions through partnerships? Um, you know, That's a lot of journal, a lot of the publishers are really taking a lot of heat for things. And, you know, the entire UC system has basically told Elsevier, we don't like your terms. And and it's it's trickling down to faculty considering not submitting to journals that are under Elsevier and going elsewhere. So it's, it's an active conversation wow. that I hear amongst colleagues all the time. So well, I, I like that better than, because you can't shift everything to the open access options because then those are expensive to publish in, right? So I think yeah. if there could be some give and take, sounds good. Um, so how, you I mean, you brought this up and this is one that I, I'll tell you from our black students in our program we've talked about and, and I don't like the answer as a program director that we've had for them to be totally honest, which is, how can universities hold faculty accountable when they say racist, bigoted comments? Uh, um, we, we don't have teeth is what I've said in some of this, but it, it bothers me. It really bothers me in terms of what, what can we or cannot we do so, or what can we not do? And I think it's mostly, I would say, due to lack of creativity or the fear of some kind of litigious society that, you know, that the faculty who are, who are maybe accused or, or try attempt to hold accountable are then, um, defensive in a way that, that sort of prevents it from be, being really addressed. Yeah, so. I, again, I go back to, we know who's racist, so let's not pretend that we don't know. I don't know their heart. Well, listen, if 20 students say this person is saying racist comments to them, doesn't matter if they're racist or not, they're saying racist comments, right? And I think that's where the teeth has to come in. If the students, I mean, if the schools mean it, that they don't want to promote racism in their uh, organizations, these professors who are making these comments need to be written up in trouble suspended and if they continue, ask to leave. Um, because the longer you say, well, they're famous, they bring in this money, they bring this, and they also bring that toxic environment to your department and your institution. So if you're okay with all of that, then don't write it in your letter that we do all that we can to fight racism in our department, because it doesn't happen. So I think it just has to have teeth. Like you said, they can fire people. And it's one of these things where because these students are marginalized, they don't have the power to like 
you know, get a lawyer and do all this high power lawsuit to go against the university system to get this professor out because who can afford that or have their parents afford it. So there is a protection there. But if you mean it, then mean it. If you don't, then save your statement. Yep. I, uh, same thing for sexist it. professors. I mean, it's, it's this, right? It's, it's all the same thing. The students know who's the sexist professor. Undergrads and grad students know. So if yeah. everybody knows why we think we can't make a case against that, you know. I, that's I, not I, I, culture. That is called allyship and law and equity. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 Ken, but I, I, yes, I agree with you. It's, it's very frustrating to witness and, and, but not witnessing and not doing anything. It's, it's, it's very, um, it, it hits, it hits you. So uh, this is one I know that I, I brought up, I think with you before, and I had actually drafted one similar, but I'll, I'll ask with this. And, you know, um, right now there, there is this responsiveness, which we want to see not just be reactive, but become proactive kinds of, I mean, you said, um, a lot of, um, you know, our HBCUs being inundated with requests in response. And, and I think with that, what are the appropriate ways, what are the best ways, best practices to respectfully approach them? That this is not, and I say this because I'll say, I'll put this out there as a little bit, maybe offend some, maybe our, some of our friends is, I shouldn't say George Tech, with, with that, but, but with NSF, they, they will favor ones if you will include certain uh, URM traditional institutions or HBCUs in your applications. And sometimes people just go out checking those box. And I, my fear is that are they being fully respected for what they contribute to the, to the science mission, to the education mission, or is it just that that is, is viewed as the, the tokenism to promote something and make something an elevated status. And I guess it's similar with the HBCUs. And there's a, there's an appropriate way to do this. And it's not just, you know, it's, it's respecting what they bring to the table, I think as well. Right, so I love that last part about respecting what they bring to the table. Um, <laughs> oh, you're recording Put you on the spot me. on this one. Okay. <laughs> you're recording me. No, 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 I mean, okay, here we go. So here's the deal, right? The, 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 I have several friends who own faculty at HBCUs, right, clearly. And um, they know when they're being used for a certain reason, right? But, and they know that. They don't always like it, but also if it brings some money and some support for their students, then some of them will eat, eat that just because it will enable their students to have opportunities that would be different if they were not a part, right? But um, it's also, I think, valuable for them to then exercise that power um, when necessary. And so, as you know, we run an NSF center together. I was the diversity director, and I'm not saying I was and I would make sure that when it was time for NSF to review that they would, NSF would at least know what we needed for the diversity efforts because that did help the leadership get things moving. And so I think they know, I mean, I mean, those people aren't oblivious. They know what the game is, um, but where it gets to be actually much riskier for them is if, and I've seen this happen before, where they might submit letters for grants and then the, you know, the PI doesn't ever give the money to the institution. It says, oh, we changed our direction. And they don't like to get burned like that, but once, right? And so that's where it becomes, now you're burning some bridges. So, uh, but I think they are aware. And I think the institution who marginalized them in that partnership misses out. Because what I always like to remind them, and you've heard me make some of these comments, like you're like, oh, we can't bring on another researcher if they're at the minority serving institution, uh, because then we, well, because we need a researcher. They do research. <laughs> they have PhDs. They actually do research. Just because they do it at this institution instead of your institution, they are researchers. So don't think you're getting someone in place of a researcher. And that's such an offensive comment. Sorry. Okay. I'll leave that for you for the next question. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's, ex that's exactly why I wanted to bring that up. It's exactly that, I think. And I think, you know, that's on the, the side of the group being asked. But I think that the, the groups, I would, I would say, guilty of not taking full advantage of that opportunity right. with the sincerity and the thoughtfulness is I think the part it's they need to again it goes back to the same things about what do what can we be doing to make those folks aware uh when they're when they're doing and, and the you can recruit their right. students if they felt like equal partners because the students also go to the session and see if they are being fully included in the group like and if you treat them like charity when they're there then why would i come to your institution and you still think you're doing charity like i'm smart i'm hard working i'm not your charity case and so that's why the the, the institution misses out because we're <laughs> everyone catches it we're not like oblivious right we know what's happening right All right um let me ask one with this let's get a little more personal but i think again i, I know you want to and i know from some of the things and other stories <laughs> without going to any specifics 
as a black man in, Mac in academia, have you ever have you ever felt muzzled? And when you have not, you know, been able to speak your voice uh, for fear of, and the 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 question here, I'm reading like right off is is uh, being viewed as angry black man. <laughs> Um, <laughs> if someone's going to view me as an angry black man, they're going to view me as an angry black man, no matter how I act or say. Um, have I ever felt muzzled? <sighs> I'll say I should have felt muzzled more times than I actually was muzzled. Um, one thing that I, <laughs> but I, I will be honest, I give a lot of credit to that, to the way I was raised, but also to my training at Morehouse, which it was, you are voice in that room, your voice is there to be heard speak it. And again, I remember early faculty meetings when I felt like, oh, I really don't like this. I'm the new person. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. Well, but nobody else is. Okay, I'm going to say this, right? So, and then even when I joined my review panel at NIH, even when I was just visiting, not even a full member, I would say things that I was like, this might offend someone, but how come you're giving this kind of credit to this person, but you didn't give it to the other? Because I'm in the room to talk. And so I, I'm fully, well, not fully aware. If those things have become impediments in my own success in future, which I'm sure some of them have, then I have made the decision consciously that I'm still going to speak up in this moment. And, um, you know, I, I've spoken at my, at my BMES talk in 2017 about when I started this job, for me, there was no guarantee I was going to get tenured five years later. So if I kept waiting and trying to play nice until I get tenured, and then I didn't get tenured, then I wasted all this time to have impact, to you know, make change, to get people to think. So, you know, I'm gonna say it as it goes. And if there's consequences, then there are consequences. I don't know if that's smart. <laughs> my, I sleep at new, night. I get sleep at night. So I look, you know, we've known each other a long time. You know, you know I'm I'm not um, one to ever be shy personally either, but to say the same thing. And that's the same thing I've told trainees in other respects and regards is you got to live with yourself. And when you go yeah. home with that at the end of the day, and again, I'm, uh, I've always been, I've always been proud of your voice and speaking up and not do it and, and having the moment afterwards where you've said, should I have said that? And you know, I'm going <laughs> to not tell you, yes, Manu, you need to say that. Um, and you can say it. And that's, it has been a powerful thing, uh, you know, not just for trainees, I think for faculty, myself and others to see. We need those perspectives. We need those opinions in there. Let, let me ask one that's coming from obviously students on this. What, what can students do? Um, I think this is also because sort of being almost a vulnerable population. What can they do if they're experiencing microaggressions, particularly from their thesis advisor or other just faculty in general, committee members, examiners? Um, is it worth having candid, a candid conversation with it? And I think that, you know, that's always dangerous. What would be the best way you would advise students to approach that? You know, there are other outlets, but what are the best ones that you would advise? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great, that's a great one. Um, so thanks for asking whoever brought that one up. Power dynamics are real in academia, right? And, but I think there is a perception that this person controls your whole future. And if you ever speak up against this person, they'll never sign off on anything. Well, listen, again, same vein, they may not sign off on it anyway. Right. So um, I think there's a way and I, you know, another training that I do for students is assertiveness training. My system will help me prepare that about how to have a respectful, assertive conversation that you make your point known without being disrespectful to the quote boss, because everyone is a human being. Right. I didn't end with the human bill of rights this time, but everyone's a human being. That person that you think is like in control of you is a human being. Right. And you are a human being. We are there's no we are the same. And so you 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 deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to have access and options. And so I think there's just an honest way of having a conversation. And we can talk more about that later. Whoever can email me. But one thing that is a big tip in, in the service training is ways on how you communicate and is using I statements. Right. Like I don't say you're a racist. I feel that statement came had, had, had racism in it. Right. I'm not going with your racism. That statement, though, was racist. And I, or and if it wasn't, I feel as it was, because you can't argue with me about how I feel, but you can argue with me about how you are. And, and that's just one of the incidents. But there's also softer ways to lead that up. But I think it's a life skill in that no matter where you go, people will push against you and want their demands over yours. And so it's um, advocacy and advocating for yourself and self-agency. Like these are all things that you should learn while you're a grad student. 
And the other thing I'll say is there are laws and rules and offices at the institution to protect you. And you should know that. And if they blackmail you and talk trash about you and won't write you letters of recommendation, just know that people have recovered from that also. No, oh, it's, an, it's an important one, I think, because there's a huge fear factor that prevents people from speaking out for those right. until they can find the people to connect with to let them know. And, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's rarely probably a single occasion as well, as you said. Right. That, well, and that's the other pattern. thing I want to say here, too. There's also the underground, right? So just if you are having that in incidence with a professor, probably others have and probably other people know. It's just like me saying, like, we know who the racist professors are. Somebody's like, oh, I think you said something racist. Oh, who? That one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's why there is protection in the system somewhat, okay? Because if it's happening to you, it's happened to others, most likely. Yeah. Let me give you another one sort of follows up with that. And this is, this is you know, I, I've felt mm. in this situation and it's one that I've seen. And I think you've heard me say it maybe as well. I've said it in faculty meeting things we've had recently with it. Uh, this comes from an undergrad, but it's, it's true for, I think, some of us faculty seeing the same the same observation. That is, how can undergraduates convince faculty to be more involved in systemic change? The number of white male faculty who have been silent or only taking actions to check boxes is really disturbing. And I'll, I'll, I'll partner with that. I'll add one comment. And I don't, I don't mean for you to challenge it in this way, but I, I, want, I want to still get your perspective. Um, it's really uncomfortable for senior white male leadership confronted with this because they are the figureheads in the positions of some of these things that could have, that are limiting change. And, and when you start to point it out, there's, I've seen patterns of a quick, a lot of patting on the back of each other first with what they are doing. And in, in spite of look at the stats, like they, the other way, you know, Megan, I talked about it is for some reason, scientists and faculty turn off the critical analytical mind when they walk into a faculty meeting or other meetings. And all of a sudden it's all emotion and feeling and somehow the data analysis part escapes. I, this has bothered me since I was a junior faculty in many regards, but this one coming to a head, seeing it over the last six, four to five months, it's yeah. been a consistent pattern. And, and I'm, I'm not surprised that undergraduates are paying attention to this or students in general and seeing this as well. So um, my answer is gonna disappoint you, um, but you can't change them, right? You can't, but that doesn't mean that the progress doesn't happen. So they can still allow the, the actions to happen, whether their mind is changed or not. And so I think that's what we're seeing in this moment with the young people really demanding things from leaders of institutes and departments. And so the way that I would say that has to happen, like if there's, so for example, what has worked in, in, in our department explicitly, and, and not that we've had people who are expressly resistant, but you know, everyone needs some pushing. Um, climate study surveys, Students who speak very honestly in a climate study survey, whether anonymous or not, who speak honestly, that message is carried through. If it's anonymous, then it's a headless uh, statement that can sometimes really hit hard when someone receives that feedback. And what you'll also find out is about leaders and people who want to achieve and climb ladders in industry or the academy, they can't have these kind of things on their record that can easily be pulled when they want to go to the next place that, oh, it looks like your department had X, Y, Z, Z issues. They have to respond to it. What did you do when that came up? Nothing. Oh, because, you know, because as you get up higher, the face of the company needs to look a certain way, whether it is or not, it's got to look that way. And so that is why I always say, like, I love this groundswell the young people are doing. I don't even want to tell them what to do. They've been doing all the right things, it seems like. But if in your space that push is not happening, then you need to recruit some allies and friends. And if that doesn't happen, there's a person above everyone. I mean, even the president of an institution has a board of governors, a board of directors, a board of regents, or something whom they report to. And if it gets that high, no one then cares, okay. But trust, people that wanna climb do not like blemishes on their records. Now, white supremacy is a whole other thing, so I can't say it's gonna change, but there's some place where you might get a difference whether their minds change or not. I don't care, I just need the actions to be different. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. It's not about uh, changing the people because you said that I, I'm a firm believer, you know, once you're a young adult, you're not really going to change. Right. But that doesn't mean that the systems can't change, that the outcomes exactly. can't change. That or the, that there are consequences in place that if this doesn't happen, we got a consequence. Exactly. Yeah. Let me let me ask one more before we wrap up. I mean, again, I, I, 
talk with you all day about this. And I think most of our audience is still hanging on, but we're glad to hear it. But you, you brought up one, and I do want to uh, touch on it. We've got a couple minutes. Is um, what have you found um, for admissions committee in terms of effective methods for, for training or retraining faculty and you know, students, if they're involved, to confront those implicit biases? Because they're, they're there. And you can say, oh, do you have them? But what can you do to really counter it, I guess? Right. Um, so, well, one thing we've done, um, so we have, <laughs> just like this, we will have an open, honest conversation at a faculty meeting, right? I am willing to engage. And, you know, my associate chairs and the chair of my departments has allowed us to have these raw discussions. And again, people can speak respectfully, even though sometimes they'll say disrespectful things. Fine. Um, to confront people on the things that are happening, right? And so the one strategy that I've used, and I've talked about this in the past, is, um, and I'll just tell this brief story, is, um, and this is in my 2017 BMES uh, talk also, if you wouldn't look. But part of our NSF Center, one thing our program director, who was at, who has a physical disability, he said, you know, you all are good at doing women and underrepresented minorities, but it's the third pillar of DNI that you're missing, and that's students with disabilities. And I was saying to him, shamefully, that I was like, oh, well, I don't know where to find them, or what if they make everyone else in the lab uncomfortable, or how do I know they'll be able to do the work? And as I was asking this question, it just was hitting me. These were things that they used to say about black students, and these were things they used to say about women. And so once I was like, whoa, I would be so mad if they said this about a black student. And so that becomes my check on how I will turn that around on someone who says, well, you know, these type of students that do whatever can't do X and Y. I said, what if you were talking about women? Would you be able to say that statement that women can never be able to X, Y? I, well, I didn't, I mean, I would have, then maybe it's a wrong statement to make that generalization. Um, another one that I find really is helpful, particularly in the STEM field, is we have quite a number of international um, professors or people who, you know, come to America um, and they're like after bachelors or other places and who, you know, retain accents or other things throughout their country, or even better, they've gone to like, for example, one of the Indian Institute of Technologies. And you'll hear this story about this one student came out of, this small town where they had to get the best grade in this town to get the best this to then get to this major state to then get this in th so they had to be the best at every level and so that's why we need to let this one in this is what happened to some of these young black students that you all think are not good enough to let in so that is a story that is worth showing their grit and their ability which i believe you but i will turn that same thing well let me tell you about the school this young person came from who found this opportunity, who found that, who found this, who found this. I think both of these students have overcome amazing obstacles and have learned and showed grit. Can we let mine in also? So I just try to change the, the frame of view to try to get the other frame out the way and say, would you say it if these stakes were different? And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But I also am very clear to call it out when I hear it and that it's gonna be said in a way that is going to be disruptive to the way they're fairly reviewing an application. Yeah, I think the, the respect, <laughs> sure. Well, you always are. You always are, my friend. But I think that last word is uh, it's probably the one for all of us to just really um, reflect on with it is, is disruptive. And mm -hmm. I, I remember the analogy I'll use is um, when I was a young faculty, I got one of my early grant reviews and I got a comment that said this was a this would be a disruptive technology. And I was so naive at the time that I didn't <laughs> know that was a compliment. And I, and I took it back and I said, what do they mean? You know, what is this thing? And I had to have it explained to me. I think it was probably Andreas was the one who probably explained to me. He's like, Todd, this is a good thing. Oh, okay. Changing frame reference. I think right now I'd say, is this a good way to, to sort of close out as disruptive? And people need to think about how they can be disruptive because it, exactly. it can actually, it's the agent of change, but it's a positive thing. It's not a negative connotation like we're used to hearing. So. Great. Um, we are, we are at sort of our time again, like I said, I'm sure that we could keep going for <laughs> a, a long time, but um, I just want to close this out. I want to, again, just thank you, Manu, for just so generously providing your time, your perspective, your, your just honesty uh, with all of this to really help us be better is truthfully the case and to, and to try and live this. Um, I want to encourage people. I want to say, you know, and this is a in particular for them. If, if you've been moved today and if you really are, then, then donate to something like Project Engages. Manu is having huge impact. So if you want to have tangible, you know, thanks for, for that, donate. It, and any little bit, I'm sure Manu would say, sort of like the, the Obama-like campaign, even micro donations add up. And I think it's something that we can all be considering and doing to, to continue to just, you know, in, empower the system and empower well-deserving students who really are going to benefit from it. And I'll tell you firsthand, I've witnessed it with what that program alone does. 
in large part because of Manu. Uh, obviously, he's gotten huge faculty buy-in because of it, but the, the buy-in came because of Manu. So please consider donating to that is, is okay. what I would ask. All that money goes for salary for the students. We don't keep it to line our pockets. So thank you for that plug, Todd. Projectengages.gatech.edu. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We should have put that on the slide too. So I will just say, please stay tuned. This is, as I said, the kickoff of a new series. We are already have a recruitment of several speakers on average about once per month to be looking for um, several other uh, just good friends. People we know are going to be outstanding speakers for this. So thank you all for tuning in um, and attending this. And please stay tuned for the next seminars as, you'll, as uh, uh, you can find the Gladstone website with hashtag Amplified STEM. So Manu, thank you. Have a good day. Everyone, Thanks please stay. Stay safe, stay healthy, wear a mask. Always. That's it. Thank you. COVID is real. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.